Jeezy, welcome to the podcast. What up, though? Sign in. First question I have for you is I heard like one of the, the darkest moments of your life was when you had everything that you'd ever dreamed of. A lot of success in the music industry, making tons of money, but you felt super alone. Why? A lot of different reasons. A lot of stuff that I hadn't, well, I know that now, I didn't know that then. It was a lot of stuff that I needed to deal with personally uh, from my childhood that I didn't understand that would affect me in my adulthood. And then there was a lot of betrayal in my adult life, you know what I'm saying? Just to get to where I was going from the streets to music. You got to imagine the things that I, you know, endured and encountered and the obstacles and the deaths and the, you know, the, the, the prison sentences and the backstabbing. And the, and it's just like it was I already had trust issues, but that didn't help. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know what the next level of trust issues are, but I had those for sure. Like, what did you think success was going to give you that it didn't give you? Uh, the same thing like everything else in life. Like you feel like once you get it, you'll be good. You know, you just feel like money's the answer to everything. It'll solve all your problems and you'll be great. And even the success, you think success, you know, it's just, it's just gonna make, it's just gonna, you're gonna wake up and take this magic pill and everything's gonna just be just fine. And the reality of it is success brought more anxiety, more depression, more vices, more failed relationships, even friendships that you felt like because people start to look at you different. And, you know, it's one thing when you are lying, too, but then when you turn into food as well, you know, it gets a little tricky. It was a real thing to try to navigate, you know what I'm saying? And I just think that all that caused a lot of um, anxiety and depression for me at the time. I feel like so many people fall into this happiness trap where they're like, when I get to this point, I'll be happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. You're still out here grinding in business and doing your thing and, and really making a difference in the world. How do you avoid falling into that same happiness trap you did before? I'm not going to front. I still fall into it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say that. But what I do understand about it now that you have to be realistic. And I think what I've learned over time is about good people, you know, good company that are like minded family, your kids, your hobbies, you know, what they say, like, you know, if you have bad habits, then you will have bad results. If you have good habits, you have good results. So like taking care of yourself, to me, all those things are like happiness. Like people see me exploring and doing things, you know, you see me on the golf course. I actually like it, you know? I mean, you gotta think about all the brothers I know that are locked down. It's good to get some fresh air, you know, on your own time. and smoke your cigars and drink your, you know, drink your, uh, like my um, nephew Mateo say, your whiskey. You know what I'm saying? But I don't drink whiskey, but that's what he says. That's happiness to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I've had, you know, even before rap, I had millions and millions of dollars and I've lost it and I got it back and I lost it and I got it back and I lost friends and I, this and it's like you're chasing this thing. It's like you're on this treadmill. You're just running and you're running and you're running and running and eventually you burn out, right? And then you hit rock bottom and then you gotta climb back up and do it all again. And what I noticed was I was never happy in that. But now I take the time to like build like real relationships with people, like actually get to know them, get to know their kids, you know. I look forward to, you know, holidays to spend with my family, you know what I'm saying? Like it was a time I I it was a time in my life like I didn't even count on Christmas because I didn't know if I was gonna make it. Either way. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't know if I was gonna be dead or in jail. Like it was just like I right, you know, New Year's was like, I made it again. You know, my 21st birthday, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe I made 21. You know what I'm saying? I had me going at 17 for sure around that time because it just was everything that was going on. I was like, there's no way in the hell I'm going to survive this. But, you know, nowadays, and that's why I pushed that, you know, that, that card. And I, it, it sounds kind of different coming from somebody with a background and a past that, like I have. But it's almost like going to found that found the youth and you found it and you're like, yo, you, you go over here and drink from this. It's, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna help you out. And it's like I found that, you know, and it, it was something that was hiding in plain sight, and something that you know, a lot of uh, people around me couldn't tell me because they was damaged as well. So I had to get outside of my circle and find that and understand it was right there, and hiding in plain sight. And I just had to uh, lean into it. But it took a lot though because. You know, when you have trust issues, it's hard to bring people closer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then when you don't want to open up to people, it's hard for people to get to know you. You know what I mean? So it was like 
a lot of push and pull with that. And I had to do some work with myself to just start opening up, having conversations, telling people how I feel without taking an aggressive approach. Because all I knew where I came from is aggression. You know, the most aggressive person get, he, he gonna move the needle. <laughs> you know, you from Baltimore, you know how to go. <laughs> And, and and the little things, you know what I'm saying? Like being able to get up early and meditate and journal and, you know, just have scheduled calls with people you just want to sit down. I was just telling you I talk to Robin Sherman all the time and Robert Green and Tony Robbins and those guys and T.D. Jakes. It's just like, it's great to talk to like-minded people and have just open conversations that are, like, safe. And to me, that, that that brings happiness as well. Even with some of my, just my peers or my friends, and just, just talk about life. How you doing? You good? What's going on? And somebody tell you, no, actually I'm not. <laughs> and you go, okay, well tell me about it. And you have a conversation, you guys work through something and, and you walk away and they always say, if you want to be happy, help somebody else. No doubt. And and, and gratitude, by the way, that's that's a big one. The gratitude is so yeah, important. Yeah, I, I had to learn that. I had to learn that one because even in my lowest moments, you know, I had to think about, you know, how grateful I was. And that time you was talking about when I was in that space, I had all this fame, all this money, all these things, but I don't think I was grateful, right? Because I felt like it came with a lot. And, and I didn't understand that because, you know, you're on the other side of that. You think if I could just get over there, everything's going to be great. And then you get over there and everything's worse. You're like, what in the f this happened, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So how do you be grateful for that? It's like, you know, and, and I had to really figure that out. It's like, you know, he he who wears the crown, you know what I'm saying? And you know, too much is given, much is expected, you know? I mean, similar to you, like a lot of my childhood and how I lived my life was at that time was filled with a lot of angst, stress, turmoil, going to friends' funerals, not thinking I would live to see my 25th birthday. And I became like emotionally numb. Oh, for sure. Or it was really hard to like tap into my feelings and, and heal. So I'm curious, like, how did you begin to, like, tap into that inner world of yours and heal considering, like, all the numbness that you experienced emotionally? I tell people, man, like, the last time I remember crying was when Tupac died. And I remember, like, it was yesterday. My cousin ran in the room. And I was standing at my grandmother's house uh, in the back room. She had got an extra park built on the house. And I had been hustling. And I got this big, you know, in the flat screen, with the big screen TVs that came out. Had a big screen TV, had my whole little room set up. He came in there, he turned on the TV. He's like, yo, you, you see what happened to your boy? And I was like, oh, you know, this is hood talk. So you thinking like somebody around the corner. And he said, no, and he turned on the news. And I'm sitting looking at it on my big screen TV. They saw Tupac, they saying that he passed. And I remember it just felt like somebody just took something from me. Like I just couldn't, cause, cause to me, he was my therapist. You know, he he was my he was my preacher at the time because what he was saying to me was gospel, and I just remember that even though I was cold before that, I couldn't hold back those tears, right? Because now I feel like I don't have any guidance, but I had to figure that out later on. For me, when you lose as many people as I've I've lost, and you had as many people backstab you and cross you as I've had, you just become just numb. Right. And then when you see people go to prison, you know, 20, 30 years and 10 years here, you know, eight years there. And it's just like it's just this repeating cycle. You just get to the place where you you shut down, you know what I'm saying? And it's like fight, flight or freeze. You stay froze. Right. You just don't even you don't your, your body won't allow you to feel that. And for me, it was like it worked in my benefit, if I'm honest, because I was able to navigate through life without feeling you know what i'm saying so it's like anything i did I, I didn't really have no remorse for it because i felt like i'm protecting myself i'm protecting my loved ones and that's just it and that came if you was on the other side of me and it got to be me and you it's definitely going to be you. You, you you feel what i'm saying because I, the streets made me that way and it worked for my benefit you know what i'm saying i was able to go and have these relationships if something go wrong 30 seconds it's done I ain't even got, we ain't got to even have this discussion anymore. It was almost, I felt like it was a superpower because, you know, you grow up, you got to have that hard exterior and I had it. And it was like, that's what made me real. And it lasted until my first daughter. And with her, it was like, oh, I got a girl. You know what I'm saying? Like this, this is, this is my son. He's, he, 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 he like me, he's solid. He just, he just a good dude, but he can hold his own. And that's what I love about him. Like he's not nobody going to manipulate, like he's street smart. And he's and he's he's a uh, book smart, and 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 I made sure that 
that worked for me for so long that I was scared to give it up. But after I had my daughter, I had to learn how to love her a different way. I had to learn how to connect with her because being numb doesn't work with a baby girl. Right. That started to break down some of my walls a little bit. And then I had to learn that, okay, there are some people in this world that can be trusted, but my grandmother always told me they got to go in at a zero where they go in at a hundred and every time they do something wrong, you take something off. And that's how you learn how to trust somebody. Somebody with trust issues, you know what I'm saying? Like I might take a brick off the wall, but I'm not taking the whole wall down, right? And that started affecting my business as well. You know what I'm saying? Because now you do this business with somebody, you got to be able to trust. And it wasn't until I was, um, I started talking to one of my older friends and he just like, you know, if you just open up to people, they'll really like you, man. Like you really, you really a good guy. You know what I'm saying? I was like, no, nah, you can't, you don't understand where I'm from. You can't do that stuff. It's like, no, nah, just some people are trustworthy. As I began to like learn how to use my own judgment and figure out who I trust and start breaking down those walls, it, it, it began to lower my, my threat level when it came to people, right? And also I wanted to love my daughter the way that I felt like she needed to be loved. And that was like the beginning of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, the therapy and all these different things and it worked out. But to answer your question, probably one of the best things I've done because I've had people that I've been around for years that I finally got a chance to know because I wouldn't let my guard down so they can know me and I can know them. I think growing up like you did is often misunderstood. Talk about your childhood and like what led you down the path of, of selling drugs. Like, like why? You got to look at it like El Chapo or anybody else. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they don't look at it as selling drugs. They look at it as a family business. You know what I'm saying? This is the thing that we're successful at. And as far as I'm concerned, it was a family business. You know, my older cousins done it. My aunties did it. People that I was around in my community, it was the thing. It was how you pay your bills. So it's almost like you've been doing it so long, you don't think it's wrong. So for me, I kind of got into it because I wanted to succeed. And I knew that where I grew up at, people working in factories, doing hard labor, they didn't really have careers. So there was no other way to succeed. I mean, nobody was going to the league. There was no lawyers, no doctors. So that was the way. And I think that a lot of what was going on in my mother's house pushed me there because our relationship was so toxic and back and forth that while I was getting the love from was the streets, you know, being around guys that were older than me and them showing me love and always, you know, taking care of me, making sure I'm good and make sure I got somewhere to stay, you know, just, you, you felt like you were seen. So I leaned more into the streets. But what I realized that it was, uh, that I was, I was really gifted at the gift of leadership. I was able to build this ecosystem around me that was mostly older people that were kind of following my lead, not knowingly, because I did a lot of uh, finessing is what we call it. I would have it, <laughs> but then I would act like I gotta go get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, and it's just like I was able to, you know, get them to trust me. And I don't think they would trust someone who was older because, you know, back then when people were robbing and taking and killing. And, and I was just a young guy who knew where it was. And, and, and I built up trust with them. I didn't set out to be that. I set out to just do something that was going to get me to the next step so that I can find out who and what I was going to be. And this was the way I was going to pay my bills and fund whatever else I was doing. And I, I found a love for music through watching like the Masterpiece, the uh, Cash Money Records and all those guys. Cause those are the only millionaires we knew that we saw on TV. So I figured if I can hustle up enough money, then maybe I can become a CEO, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that was my, my, my thought, you know, you know how I go in the hood, you own a barbell beauty shop, like that's not gonna change the quality of my life, you know, nothing. Against people who own that, but I wanted to go. I don't think a lot of people know. Like my my talent is music, but my passion is business, and I felt like that was business. And I also wanted to be a businessman. So how do you get there? I'm not going to be able to walk off the streets into a boardroom. So this is where I'm going to learn my business 101. Because I definitely wasn't going to college. I mean, I didn't have time to play basketball with the other kids because I was hustling so hard. So it's like, I know I'm definitely not going to be able to go to college. So I got to learn everything. I got to learn here. And I think a lot of what you learned growing up and, and hustling and doing what you were doing has, has made you who you are today and made you, I think, successful 
in business and what you do in life. And there's a lot of people that go through hard times or do things maybe they're not so proud of when they get older and they think of it as just baggage in their life. And they don't understand that some of the same things that made that person a certain way back then can be used to your advantage today. Like how has your past and the lifestyle you used to lead, how has that like shaped how successful you are now? I definitely think it helped me with my negotiation still skills. I think more than anything, it gave me confidence because I knew if I could do this with nothing, then what can I do if I had all the resources? I do think is a gift and a curse because I had my stints of like when I first came up um, in the music game, I wanted to still live a certain type of way because that's what I felt like was going to get me to the next level. So it was a period in my life around the time I was probably depressed that I was doing a lot of things that didn't financially make sense in the beginning because now you're trying to live up to this this uh, stereotype that you built. I think if I took that time knowing what I'd known and strategically went into the business even earlier, I would be with a lot of my other peers right, right now, but I'm still going to get there. But, you know, you think about the Dr. Dre's and the and the, uh, and the Jay-Z's and all that. It's just like they just got the game earlier. Right. You feel what I'm saying? And I just think it took me a long time to get the game because I wasn't in those type of rooms because the difference between me and them is, like, I came with a lot of gangsters. So nobody really about business want to be around that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, you want to come to a meeting with 100 people, it don't make sense. But I thought that was the way to go. But on the flip side, what it taught me is how to problem solve, how to be innovative, and, and also taught me how to build a solid team, you know, and see people's gifts and be able to move people around in an organization based off, because some people just hire people because you know, they're good at this, but it's just like, have you ever asked them what are they, what, are, what, what would they like to do? Because it might be something that they're even better at. So they could do both of these things, right? As they're moving up the ladder. And it also put me in a place where I don't get discouraged when everything is not like going the way that I want it to go. Because very rarely in the streets, things go the way you want them to go. And you gotta just think about, okay, what's the plan B? And then you gotta get to yourself, there ain't no plan B. You got to make this work or we got to pivot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's just the way it works. And I think for me, that's one thing that I have that a lot of my peers probably don't because I don't know how many of them actually came from the streets. So if you're just depending on music, depending on the album to sell, depending on it, it's just like I'm way bigger than that because that wasn't the goal in the first place, right? That's just a part of, of, of what I'm building. And I think if I didn't have that confidence coming from the streets, I would have kind of been deflated when things start to not go, you know, you go from selling millions and millions and millions and millions of records and then I was like, you know, the, the market is different. You're not selling as much, but you're making more money because <laughs> you set yourself up in a different way. But I mean, a lot of people want the fame more than they want the business success. And it was like, I was always vice versa because the last thing you want to be in the streets is famous. Because if you're famous in the streets, guess what happens? Go to jail. <laughs> Your name is hot and everybody know who you are. The police know who you are. The feds know who you are. So i always been low key. i always been laid back. i always been, you know, just in the pocket. Because if I, can, if I can make my moves in the shadows, then I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If I got to be loud and boisterous and do all these antics and do all this stuff to, to sell a product or to build my business, then I'm a little concerned about that. You know what I'm saying? But in my industry, that's what it's based off of. You know, who can make the most noise? Who can make the most people look? And it's just like, they know me at the bank personally. Trust me. <laughs> I'm there all the time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like that. You know what I mean? Mr. Jenkins, how you doing? That's all I want. So I know like one of the, the biggest things that you've struggled with over the years, given your past, is trust. And so I'm curious, how have you learned to trust and believe in yourself like during times where it didn't make sense? Was it an inner knowing? Was it faith? Well, again, going back to my past, I think it helped me because I've came out of a lot of situations unscathed because I went with my gut. I went with how I truly felt, you know, and I, and I, and that's what helps me with trust now. When I walked in the room, I can feel your energy. I can feel like, okay, this is somewhere I want to be. I'm be like, I'm just, well, that's trusting myself because I'm trusting that I'm going to do or say the right thing for me, right? And if it doesn't go the way I want it to go, 
I know how to trust to give myself grace for that, right? And I think that that's a superpower to have because if you don't trust yourself, you're going to make decisions that affect people's, you know, lives in their future based off you not trusting yourself. And it's just like to be a great leader, you got to at least trust you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because if you don't trust you, you know, like what they say in war, if two people in charge, everybody dies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know you really admired Jay-Z for his ability to transition from the streets into business and, and music. And I think it was, was a T.I. that was telling you, you, know, you can't do both. You can't be in the streets and you can't be doing music. And I know you tried to do both for a long time. Speaking of trust, speaking of business, like at, at what point did you know it was time to let go of the streets and go all in on music? I didn't really have a choice. I mean, the whole building was burning down. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was literally burning down. And I, and again, you know, I'm a firm believer in God. And it just, like, when things happen like that, there's always something in place that gives me that confidence that I was doing the right thing. Because when I was making music, you know, the people that I was running with was making fun of it. They thought it was funny. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, yo, I'm, this is my exit plan. Like, I'm not doing this, you know, forever. And, and right around that time is when... All these things start to happen and you're seeing people get 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, five years, get killed, this, that. And it's happening all in one time. And I'm working on this project called Thug Motivation. And it just happens to come out. Now, mind you, when Thug Motivation comes out, which was my debut album, it did about three million. And I'm still <laughs> shaking and moving because I don't know what I want to do yet. Because in my mind, I'm like, if I walk away and this doesn't work, what am I going to do? Because my bills was real. Like, you know, I'm living in penthouses. I got, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm living a life already. And something happened to one of my close guys. And one of them was my cousin. And I knew then, I was just like, I got to go figure this out. Because I can't let him go to prison in vain. And I, I remember throwing away my uh, next tail chirps. He was talking to Walkie Talkers. And I just remember throwing, I had three of them. I had a lot of money on those phones, man. You know what I'm saying? Like people owed me real money, but I kept telling myself, I was like, if I, if, if I get it, I don't think I'm going to stop. So the only way to, is like a pack of cigarettes. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't be like, I'm just going to smoke them all and I'm going to quit. You got to throw the pack away. And I had to throw, you know, I had to, I had to just throw the phones away. And it, it's funny now. Cause you know, of course, some of these people are still moving around and when I'm, they might see me out or see me at a show or see me somewhere, but they always got this look like, I hope you don't ask me for that money. You know what I'm saying? Because it was real money. That's what I call, you know, and my other superpower was discipline. That was the discipline to say, you know what? I got to cut it short. And I think it's the best decision I ever made. Now, mind you, it wasn't easy because I did go through a point of time where it got tight. You know what I'm saying? It got, you know, and when the feds start coming in, freezing stuff and doing stuff, I was like, Shit, I might need to go back. You know what I'm saying? And figure this out. i never forget, man. It was like I had a penthouse behind Phipps Plaza, which is one of the prestigious malls in Buckhead. I remember I used to wake up like and just drenched in sweat because I had a dream that I went back and I got caught. You know what I'm saying? And it was just like that dream kept happening like every night and every night. It just got, felt realer and realer and realer until one day I was just like, I just can't. I just got to deal with this. So I just cut back on a lot of things. I cut back on like a lot of the jewelry I was buying you know, I sold a few cars. You know, I'm not wearing Versace every day. That's why for a while you just saw me and like, because I went from one extreme. I went from like, you know, Versace and all this stuff to like black T-shirts every day. Dicky, you know what I mean? But that was by design, but it was also affordable. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So now I'm balling on a budget because I'm like, this album is going to come out and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change my life. And I'll never forget it. It came out where it got leaked maybe like a month before it was supposed to come out. And I thought it was over. I thought it was over. I was like, damn, the album got leaked. It's not going to do well. Back to the streets I go. And I was already thinking about how I was going to do it. But now again, now I'm like semi-famous. So it's going to be hard for me to move the way that I was before. And lo and behold, here goes God again. The leak actually helped. Because now the music is everywhere that I wouldn't have been before the album came out. So everybody had already picked my singles for me. Like the streets had already said Soul Survivor, Trap or Die, you know, Air Forces, you know what I mean, Bottom of the Map. It was already said. All I had to do was just show up and ball. And that's what happened. I know a lot of what you were fighting for just 
the way you grew up and the way you were doing business was freedom, like freedom from the struggle, freedom from anxiety, sleepless nights. Do you feel free now? I'm finding a different kind of freedom. I want to be debt free. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't want to know nothing, no bills, no nothing. Everything paid for, and that's the fight I'm fighting now. But also for my people and my culture, because I feel like we always, they're always trying to box us in. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I fight to keep us out of the box. And I think a lot of times people don't understand that because they want you to be the same and because the things that you did, they were the same as how they related to you. But, you know, as a leader, you can't, you know, you can't walk a path. You got to go blaze a trail. And for me, it's like I'm, I'm blazing a different trail because I want to lead by example and show people like, okay, look, you're going to get have to get out here and get uncomfortable to get comfortable. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you're going to have to put yourselves in certain situations you might not feel like you need to be in to up the ante. You know what I'm saying? And for me, it's just like, it doesn't stop with just music. It doesn't stop with just art. It doesn't stop with just culture. Like, if we can sell music across the world, we should be able to do business across the world. You know what I'm saying? We should be global. We should be the best version of ourselves. And it's just like, culturally, we're taught to get this money and self-soothe our way until we're not like Prince and just become a legend that way, you know, because you didn't live ex expected past the time we expected you to live. And he's like, oh, he died too soon. Well, you put all this pressure on him, you know what I'm saying? You want him to be perfect and great and keep putting out this records that might not sell the same. But why are you boxing him in? For me, it's just like, let's tear the box down. Let's be everything we want to be, all the things we want to be. Let's do all the things we want to do. You only got one life. And it's like, I'd be damned if I'm just going to be known as an artist. That's, that's, that's not going to work for me. I know a big part of your purpose now is sharing your story and, and taking a lot of this wisdom that you're gaining from life and just some of these mentors and people you talked about earlier and then paying it forward and, and talking to your audience and your fans about it. What's been the most like meaningful like message or a letter that you've received? Oh, all of them are meaningful. I think for me, it's no different from the streets. It's like what I learned in the streets, I put it into music because I felt like it was going to help people that were going through the same thing. And I feel like now a lot of the people that have been around with me for a while have, have matured. So it's like all this information that I'm able to get. And I learned that uh, my gift is to be able to receive the information and to put it in a digestible form so that people can actually get the message. Because I think sometimes um, when you're talking to people who are, you know, extremely brilliant, it's like you got to catch the message and get it. And then, you know, because other than that, it's like all of me, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I just think that because I can take a piece from – what I learned from everyone and sit back and process it and then put it in something that if it's art, if it's, if it's a talk, if it's a sit down, if it's a fire chat, if it's a conversation. I was just in LA uh, last weekend uh, sitting down in the uh, cigar bar and talking to some friends of friends. And it was two guys there that had these issues and we, and I was just like asking questions, but I was asking questions to get a, understanding of what they were saying and I just had to go hey look it seemed like the issue is you but like have you ever tried and thought about by the time I got up the next morning I mean you know both guys had text me and they basically was like yo man just thank you so much for opening my eyes to some things that I didn't see and the reality of it is I did nothing I just gave them the information that I had obtained from somebody that I respected and passed it on to them and I feel like that's the superpower you know what I'm saying so when you ask me, I think all of it is, it just depends on the room. I'm a heavy reader. I'm a heavy, you know, I listen to podcasts. You know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm that guy. Like, I get up and I just love, to, I'm a sponge. I just love to learn. If I find out about something, it could be anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to dive deep in it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to find out the players and I'm going to figure it out. And that's just who I am because that's who I was in the street. That's what I'm like. What they, I'm a narco nerd. You can't ask me anything about a narco. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I know them all. You know what I mean? Because once I get into things uh, that fascinate me, I just try to get all the information. So when I got into self-help for myself, I wanted to know who the best people were. That that made me dig in deeper and to start to study these people and have them be my mentors without them knowing me. And now they're my mentors and they know me. And it's just like... You know, my first conversation with John Maxwell, I was just like, I just want to buy you coffee, man. Have a conversation. I got seven questions, brother. He answered all seven. 
You know, same thing with Robert Green. You know, we sat down and had tea, and I we we just had a whole conversation. But you wouldn't expect Jeezy <laughs> to be sitting down talking to Robert Green. But I want to know tell, the art of seduction. Like, how do we? <laughs> I need to figure this out. And the art of war. Like, we gotta talk. So it just depends on the conversation, uh, the timing, and the room. Because I think anything that you can learn is all of it is valuable. I mean, even my, my personal life, even with my kids, even with, you know, my peers, you know, just it's always something. And people call me a lot to ask me things. And I actually enjoy helping people work through things. You know, if this don't work out, I might be a life coach. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I might try for it. You know, you never know. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that feel trapped in their circumstances. And in, in many ways, rightfully so, because they were dealt a bad hand. Like, what advice do you have for somebody on some steps that they could take to help take themselves out of an environment that they feel trapped in? You know, I would tell them, man, it's a fight, but keep swinging. Keep swinging, don't stop swinging. If you, get, if you stop swinging, you get knocked out. And to me, it's almost like take everything with a grain of salt because everything you go through makes you, you know, wiser, smarter, stronger. I've never met a skilled sailor on the calm sea. You know what I'm saying? And if I didn't go through the things that I went through, I think the first sign of pushback or failure that I would have got if I had success, I think it would have took me out because I wouldn't know how to get back. And, and, and that mental GPS I talk about is knowing where you came from and always having that in the back of your mind and knowing if you ever got pushed back there, you would know how to get back to where you need to be. And I think that you got to look at the hard times as a blessing too. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to really look at it as a blessing because, you know, sometimes it takes rock bottom for you to get back, for you to get on top. You know what I'm saying? Stay there because you can get on top. If you fall, you know, it's hard to get back up there if you don't know what rock, rock bottom feels like. So I would tell them, keep swinging, keep fighting. One of the other things I know that really helped you in your transformation was forgiveness. And so many people struggle with forgiving people just for even the, the, the smallest things. What was the process of forgiving your mom like? And also, like, how did your relationship with her drive your ambition? My mom was feisty. She was a hustler. She was um, she was sassy. She was strong. She was resilient. Um, she was all the things. And my mom taught me how to be tough mentally and um, emotionally. And I don't think that's what she set out to do, but that's just how it worked out. And, you know, all the toxicity we had, I'm quite sure it came from her childhood as well. And... I had to, so, so what she did teach me is how to break the cycle because that's why I really dug in deep with myself because I, I don't want my kids to experience the type of relationship we had. Now, my mom was a great person. She just had her thing, you know what I'm saying, like most of us do. And I realized that, you know, at some point when, before she passed, I think she probably came to a place in her life too where she just was like, I think when my dad and her divorce, she kind of, me and my dad looked really alike. We got the same name, by the way. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, I was kind of like my daddy's son. You know what I'm saying? So that didn't help. Um, so I think a lot of the resentment came from there and, of course, what she'd been through in childhood. But I just think it, it came to a point where she just started to let her guard down. And she wasn't so tough anymore with me. And she, she asked me how I was feeling, what's going on. And we just started to have more uh, conversations. And um, before she passed, I used to go, sit with her and watch MASH and just, you know, just try to have conversations with her. Of course, she still was smart enough not to, you know, let her guard all the way down. But I think that we got to a place where we kind of forgave each other in a way. And I couldn't even say I know it was forgiving then. It was just that I know I wanted to spend time with my mother because I know she wasn't doing so well. But at the same time, it's like I can not tell you a time before that, me and my mom sat down and watched the movie before. It took her to be in her space that she was and me to be in a space where I just wanted to be there with her and sit there and actually watch, you know, MASH or uh, I forget the cowboy movie she used to watch all the time. But, you know, and, and what's the one they drive the orange car? Uh, 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 Dukes of Hazzard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And she would just sit there and just watch it. And I'm just like, okay. Gunsmoke was the cowboy movie. But I, I enjoyed that because even if we didn't say a lot of words to each other, it's the first time me and my mother sitting down actually watching some. I'm hearing the laugh. And, you know, I'm making a joke or whatever. And then we related on music as well. I made her a playlist. I still got it on my phone, by the way. And she loved that playlist. She would, like, listen to all the music she loved. And I would sit there and listen to her, too, and think about the times when I was growing up. She played it around the house. 
So my point of case is, is like, in order to forgive my mother, I had to learn how to forgive myself. You feel what I'm saying? Because there was a lot of things that I did and a lot of her mannerisms that I took on, a lot of things that I projected in my life just by growing up in that type of surrounding. And it took me to learn not how to be so hard on myself and give myself some grace then to go to her and say, you know what? I can understand why you that way because I'm that way because of, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I can only imagine what she went through, you know what I'm saying? So I think that was a big piece to it. And as far as like forgiving other, you know, just forgiving people, I had to start realizing, man, that, you know, a lot of times when people do stuff that has no integrity behind it, there might be, um, you know, backstabbing or double crossing. All that stuff really comes from a place of scarcity or fear. Fear of not having, fear of losing, fear of not being where they want to be. And once I started to understand that, I took it less personally because in the beginning, I thought it was personal. And you got to understand, I come from the street. You do something to me, I got to do three things to you. <laughs> it's just how it works. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't see it no other way. And I'm like, you know, why am I pressing the line on people who don't understand my level of aggression? Because they didn't understand the level of the betrayal because they don't know where I came from. So they thinking they're just doing something, but it's just like, you can't pull that over my, uh, like, like I've been doing this my whole life. Like you're so new to this. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like going to prison and trying to fool a, somebody who's been in there for life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, he done heard every conversation there is. He done seen every type of person he is. He can read through you. And it's just like that. It's just like, you know, you come to the blog. It's just like, if you're a robber, I can see that. You know what I'm saying? If you're a jack, I can see that. If, you, if you're the police, I might feel that. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, what I learned with people is they start to try to pull, you know, these, these things where they think are going to advance them in life and not knowing that the more loyal you are, you know what I'm saying, the more of a team player you are, you'll get to where you're trying to get twice as fast. But if you call somebody out to get it, you might get it. But you got to know that, that whoever you're going to work for next, whoever you're going to be with next, what I got to, you know, I know this person. They're going to call me and say, hey, you know, such and such used to be with you. You think I'm going to tell them, oh, they're great. <laughs> they're lovely. No, I'm not. I'll be like, look, man. I can't tell you how to run your business, but I can tell you they're not with me no more, so that's what I tell you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had to learn that. I had to learn that, and I had to learn that it's like this. I'm going to use this analogy. It's like when you have mistrust and you have trauma and you have all this bad energy inside of you, look at yourself like a fridge. And if you leave perishable items in the refrigerator for a long time and you open that refrigerator door up, it, it, it don't smell so good, right? Stench, it's like, shh. And what I notice is when you forgive and you and you work through your stuff, you get all that stuff out. So that refrigerator, that, that's inside of you is fresh. And it's just like, when you don't forgive, you're just building up this resentment. And chemically, that doesn't even work with your body, right? It makes you sick. That's what they call it, you know, distress is stress. It's where cancer and all these things come from. And what I learned is it does me no service to not forgive somebody, right? I'd rather get it off me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You deal with that. You forgive it. You know, you, you deal with that. You know, you got to see your maker. I don't, you know, I'm, God bless you, brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? What was the hardest thing you had to forgive yourself for? Oh, man, sheesh. I think my cousin getting locked up because I know that he wasn't a criminal and he gave 10 years of his life in prison. And he played basketball, he was a cool kid. Like, he went into something like that. And one of my good friends as well, you know what I'm saying? Because they wasn't street guys. They kind of just was rolling with me. And, you know, when you think about that much time, you know what I'm saying, that you lose and you can't give it back to him. You know what I'm saying, at all. And I think for me, that was just like, it still bothers me to this day sometimes, if I'm honest. You know what I'm saying? I'm surprised sometimes they call and check on me. Like, cuz, you good? I'm like, yeah, I'm straight. I'm all like, you good? You know what I mean? Because, you know, they, they got that much love for me, you know, and I have to ask myself, how would it be if the shoe was on the other foot? You know what I'm saying? I ask myself that sometimes. You talked about, like, responding impulsively. Like, if somebody does you wrong, you got to do them wrong, like, three times. You know, a lot of people struggle with instant gratification. You came from a world where you were chasing fast money, able to make a lot of money fast, success fast, that sort of thing. 
but then you've also been able to like harness it. I know you lost a bunch of weight, which takes a lot of like patience, gratification. You transformed yourself personally, emotionally, patience, built a very successful career in the music industry, patience, delay gratification. How did you win that battle where you went from just chasing fast money, living a life like you've described throughout this conversation to being to being able to, to delay that and be patient with some of these things that take time? I'm always looking down the road. And even when I was chasing fast money, I didn't look at it as my money. I looked at it as marketing, which why I, why I was the one that was walking around Magic City with the Jeezy chains on and Jeezy on my jersey and passing out my CD and throwing the money. It's, it's marketing. It's, it, of course, it's a lifestyle, but I'm not throwing my money for nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, at least if I'm going to do this, they're going to see me. My gratification has always been delayed. Like, I feel like when things come fast, they don't last long. And for me, I'm always looking 10 years down the road because that's just who I am as a person. When I was in the streets, I was already thinking about what it was going to be like to be free and to grow up in this. Like Once I passed 21, I was like, okay, I could, I could, I, I think I could do this. You know, all of us used to buy cars or whatever, and it used to be some guys from the hood that would drive their cars every day. Like, every day. Every time you see them at the car wash, every time you see them at the corner store, because we know all our cars because... Who got what car, who got what rims, who got this and that, and that's how you know who who getting money. And that's like a thing. For me, I would drive my cars like every four months because I would be like in a rental car or like a, a low-key Grand Prix or whatever because I wanted to be so incognito. But my point in case is I would have rather waited to shine than to just to be shining all the time is what I'm saying. I, there was no need for me to be out every day. I got money. I'm living this life. <laughs> it's like I want to stack the money because then I now I want to go do music. So how do I do that? So when people were going to buy Ferraris, I was buying studio equipment. You know what I'm saying? My friends get new watches every week. You know what I'm saying? I'm buying T-shirts because I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, if I can pull this off, I think it's going to change the quality of life all the people around me, and especially my children. Well, at the time, I only had my son. And that's what I was going for. And I believe that that's the reason why I was able to get out of it. Because if you're looking for something fast, it may come. But you're not going to be able to sustain it because it's not real. And I feel like that's the problem with today's generation is, is they want instant gratification. You know what I'm saying? So it's like... And Instagram and social media doesn't help that because when you're looking at all these people's snapshots of their highlight reel of their lives and you're going, damn, he got made back. He got a family. We got this and that. I don't even look at that shit no more. <laughs> I don't even care. You know what I'm saying? But my mind is somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm looking forward to great conversations, a great bottle of wine. How, what can I learn? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm 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 building that part because to me that's the most important part. But if I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses at this point in my life, that's a problem. I think one of the other things that really haunts people when they're trying to make a change, just constantly making excuses and doubting themselves and, and falling into that victim mindset, which in many ways can be rationalized given the situation that they're in, like like what do you say to somebody that just continues to make excuses and not change it? Well, there's only three roles you can play in your life. Hero, the martyr, the victim. I'm going to be the hero every time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like nobody's coming to help you. Nobody's coming to help you. And the more excuses you make for yourself, the farther you put yourself behind the finish line. And I feel that the thing that makes people different, that are successful, is they're so laser focused and relentless about what they do. It don't matter if they win or the losing, they're gonna just keep going. And they're not gonna stop. And I think that's what makes the difference because if you're taking time to complain, you're not moving forward. If you're taking if you're taking time to like make excuses, you're not moving forward. I got up this morning, the first thing I said to myself is like, damn, I don't wanna get up this morning. But you know where I was at eight o'clock in that boxing gym. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, like I ain't got no choice. I got I got to stay healthy. I got to stay punctual. Because if I'm late for that, I'm going to be late for you. And late for the other six meetings I got today, right? But you would think at this level of success, you can lay back. No, I'm not making no excuses to be late here or be late for my next meeting or be late for that. Like, why, why am I going to do that? 
this is life that I prayed for. This is what I wanted. I got it. So what am I going to do with it? And if you make them, you, you making excuses, you don't deserve that. And, and by the way, fact to fact, if you're a man, a woman hates a man that makes excuses. <laughs> and a man hates a woman that makes excuses. So I don't know how that's going to work out for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You talked about boxing this morning. I know you're also big into meditating, reading, listening to podcasts. What are some other like daily or weekly habits that you practice to keep you centered and grounded? I love journaling. I love golf. I know we talked about that a little bit. I love like meeting people too, like new people and just having like, you know, just cool conversations. And then I love to like, you know, take time to like actually sit down and talk to people that are doing things that I'm interested in. I want to break the glass sitting on my real estate portfolio. So I've been meeting with a lot of my friends and people that I know that are really big in that space and just asking the questions. I love that. I also love fishing, love fishing. You know what I'm saying? And I love to be, I love to be outside. Like I love, like I'll take a wilderness hike in a minute. Like that's just peaceful for me. Like just get away from everything and just, just walk and just, you know, smoke a Cuban cigar and just, you know what I'm saying? Just, ah, uh, you know. I know you're big in the like mindset shifts and changing your mindset. What's been a, like a mindset shift that you've had to make in the last like six months or so? I just started reading more books to, of things like that are not just things that I'm passionate about. Just like challenging myself, like, you know, to do things. Like I really want to learn how to play chess well. So I've been like getting into that and just like, it might be some books about, I'm, work, I'm reading this book now, uh, Mandela's book, you know what I mean? But, like, a lot of times I read, like, a lot of self-help stuff. But this is, like, I want to read about somebody else's story to see what they've been through, how they did it. That helps to shift your mindset as well, right? Because you know what you know, but when you hear other things, you get in that, too. I would say mind shift, really just eating clean and healthy because that, that, that helps your mind as well. Like, because when you feel energized and you feel better, you're able to think clearer. And I think clarity is, is is the best thing ever. You know, on the other, other side of clarity is anxiety, and I don't want that. So when I say mind shifts, I would say definitely that. And then also, like, just really taking the time to be present with everything that I'm, that I'm involved with. Like, what are you most grateful for now? Man, my kids, man. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my family. You know, I love my sister and all my people. My dad. I'm grateful for my team. You know, I'm grateful for the, the great group of friends that I've been able to just build over the years and just seeing where they at and being happy for their success and being able to have these like-minded conversations, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for prayer, grateful for meditation. I'm grateful for journaling. I love that. It's like I'm a writer naturally, so it's just like, you know, I, I love that. It's just like, that's like my minute in the morning. I'm just like, oh, write about, you know what I mean? Like, I'm grateful for things and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for you know, just the grace that I've been able to give myself. Like, I'm very grateful for that. I know you talked about the mental GPS and that you have, like, this confidence in yourself to be able to rebuild something if you lost it completely. And a lot of that comes from the way you grew up and, and the lifestyle on the streets and stuff. Do you think somebody needs to, like, live in an environment like that to develop that type of mentality? Because so many people struggle with failure and they're afraid of taking a chance because they're like, if I take this chance and I fail, like, what am I going to do? I mean, do you think that people need to grow up like in a certain environment, or can they just do it by taking chances? Absolutely not. And I think failure is the best teacher. I think it is. I, I truly, I, I, I'm not saying it because it sounds good. I'm saying I think that you're going to have to fail your way to success. It's the only way you're going to be like really good at something. You know, like you got to know what you did wrong, see how you can pivot or adjust. I'm grateful for my failures as well. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't think without my failures, I would be here. I would say no, that they don't have to live a certain life. I just think they would have to be have a certain mindset to know that life is seasons. You're going to have a summer, winter, and spring, summer, fall. You know what I'm saying? So you got to know that winter time is coming. You know, it might be a, you know, just a, a short window of time where things ain't the way you want to be. And then the summer comes and the sun is out. And you got to, you know, adjust to that too. But the mental G GPS part of just knowing that, just know how far you came. You could be a college student. You know, just know how far you came, and, 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 and if things don't go the way you want them to go, and you have to start from scratch, you should be okay with that because now you start from scratch with more wisdom and knowledge than you had when you started from scratch the first time. So that's what the mental GPS is. I have obtained these tools. I have this information. I have this data. 
So I'm not just starting over from like completely scratch. I'm starting over from knowing that now I have resources. Now I have relationships. Now I, you know, I, now I have a banker. Now I have a, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay, what do, let's get everybody in the room. Like, what do we need to do? I don't want to hear the problem. I want to hear the solution. You talked about how you sat down with people like Robert Green, Robin Sharma, John Maxwell. Who's somebody that you would also like to have coffee with that you haven't been able to reach yet? Mm, that's a great question. I don't know why I feel like I want to talk to Elon, though. I just want to pick his brain. <laughs> Smart <laughs> guy. Saying? Yeah, I just want to see what's going on over there. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, you know he, I mean, but I, I, just, I, I want to know what he went through as a child to even make him think as far as he, he he's thought and where he's going with it and, 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 the, and the way that he thinks. I think that's it's almost like a prophet. You know what I'm saying? You're, 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 you're ahead of your time. Like, most of the world ain't even there where he's at. And I would definitely like to know his morning routine because he got some other going on over there. <laughs> there, was a, there was that point in your life where you were struggling with your mental health. You were drinking a lot. You were struggling a lot with depression, anxiety. What were some of the things that, that some of the tools that, like, helped you, like, get out of that place? Well, I started to realize when I slowed down a lot of that, it gave me a lot of clarity. Like I said, if you don't have clarity, there's anxiety Anxiety there. I think when I was given the tools to understand what I was going through and not to feel like something was wrong and there was some type of birth defect, because that's what I thought. I thought, like, you know, why I'm, why can't I sit here at this table and have a conversation when I feel like I want to jump through the ceiling? I didn't understand that, you know, and, and I had a lot of post-traumatic stress. And I didn't know the words to these things. So I'm only telling you what I've learned over time. So as I learned what was going on with me, it was easier for me to figure out the things that I needed to do the change and then the alcohol didn't just help because I, 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 I don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting up here, you know, I'm gonna have a glass of whatever I want, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use it as a moment for me to enjoy and not a vice, you know, cause you can enjoy a glass of wine, but once you start to use it as a vice, that's where it get a little tricky, right? Cause I'm using this to self soothe. I'm using this to numb all these different things. So when I learned the difference between the two, I'm like, okay, I can, I can do that because I'm very disciplined. So it's just like, if I feel like, you know, this is not helping me, then I'm able to cut certain things. And I think that that helped a lot because that freed my mind up because when you're drinking and you're like, you know, not healthy, you're not eating your best. I was 260, you know, at, at, at that time, you know what I'm saying? Overweight, skin bad, all the things I didn't want. And once, I, and, and, and true story, I started right before the recession and I had a show in Boston. <laughs> And this is when I dropped the 60 pounds. Now, mind you, in my shows used to be all gangsters and killers and thugs and everybody in the front row. In this particular role, this particular show, the album cover had been out, the artwork was out, people were talking about the album. So I'm like 60 pounds lighter, you know, skin good, all this. When I got on the stage, the whole front six rows were all women. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going back you know? <laughs> so that was one thing that gave me clarity also understanding what I was going through like that there, there, was, there was a name for it that made that, that made me feel like it just wasn't me and when you, when you started talking about it other people like yeah I was depressed and then I was like whoa you too so it's just like a thing you know it's not like you and, and, and it's, it's just not like your own thing this is something that happens in life then how do you deal with it you know what I'm saying it's like you can't tell somebody from the hood to go take a walk you know what I'm saying? Just walk, you know, just. But when I started to realize when I walk, I think better. Now I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Cause now I could take a walk and help take some stress off, but I'm actually thinking of my next moves. You know what I'm saying? If somebody tell you like, you know, you, you do fitness as well. It's like, you know, you gotta work out, you gotta take care, you gotta get, build your muscle mass, you gotta do all these things. When I figure that out, I'm like, okay, I feel healthier. I can go around, I can do things. I can get up earlier. You know what I'm saying? There was a time where I wasn't even drinking water. So, like, imagine that. And then somebody's like, you got to drink a gallon of water a day. I'm like, I'm not doing that until you do it. <laughs> and, and then you start feeling better and you start understanding things. And it's like, it was small things like that that just started to build. And then I started to feel more and more and more and more invincible. You know what I'm saying? With whatever my stresses were and whatever undue stress came at me, I was able to see it with clarity. And that helped me out a lot. And the biggest thing was, when I was able to share my story and other people started to come to me too and be like, you know, I was going through anxiety. I had post-traumatic stress. Man, your story, you know, compelled me to work through it. That really made the difference to me because it was almost like, you know, I was a little reserved from saying that because you don't talk about these things where I'm from. 
but I think it brought me closer to my people because I think a lot of black men experience this and there's no safe space for them to talk about it. You know, I'm hoping this opens up that dialogue between, you know, the different tribes of people that, you know, got that brotherhood. You can go talk to your brother and tell him, man, you know, I'm not doing so good, bro. Speaking of relationships, obviously they're very important to you. I know you've had people in your life that have brought you down. And I think a lot of times people have a hard time letting go of those people because they're like, you know, I hung out with them for a certain amount of time. They were my cousin. They were a friend, my neighbor, whatever the, the example is. Like, how have you been able to, like, let go of people in your life that weren't bringing the best out in you? Mm, I think when I hit rock bottom, and I don't think I really had a choice. Like, it was got to the point where we just wasn't aligned. You know, nothing that we did together made any sense. It's almost like drinking. It's, it's almost like, you know, if you're an alcoholic and you stop drinking and you're trying to be sober and your friends are still drinking, it's, it's just like, what do we have in common? And it's just like, um, it was a lot of times, like, I'm trying to move in this direction. And a lot of my people I came up with just wanted to stay here. And I'm just like, okay, but if I stay there, I can't go do this great thing that God's given me this gift to do to help other people. So what does that mean? You know what I'm saying? And, and it, it it was the, it, to answer your question, it was one of the hardest things I ever done was to make that decision because I was like, I had so many people that was down for me, with me and whatever. And when I made that decision, it went in the instance, it was like I was just by myself. And it was like really nobody like around no more. And you kind of feel like this is what made you you, being the guy that moved with that type of power. And it's all of a sudden it's gone, but then you realize you're more powerful by yourself. And you can touch more people by yourself. And it's not it's not easy. You know, it's not it's it's not it's not easy, and that's why I understand what a lot of these guys are going through in the NBA and, you know, just all these different, you know, situations where you find that you have somebody so talented or so um, driven, and then just with the company they keep, you know, they keep getting in these situations that you go, you're so beyond that, right? And until you make that decision, and if you got real people in your circle, they should understand that. They should. I'm not saying they will but they should. This has been an awesome conversation. I wanted to thank you so much for your time, for coming on and for sharing and being so vulnerable. For people that want to follow you if they're not already, if they want to listen to your to your music, if they want to find out what you're doing with your businesses, like where's the best place to do that? Uh, definitely Instagram, Facebook, Jeezy at Instagram, J-E-E-Z-Y. I, I, I'm often on Twitter. I've got to talk to Elon. We've got to figure some things out. But also you could check out my book, Adversity for Sale. And it, it's basically a motivational business memoir. It talked about a lot about my life and a lot of the lessons that I learned. I just put out a project. It's called um, I Might Forgive, But I Don't Forget, produced by Justice Lee. It's amazing. And other than that, you just see me out, man. I've been moving around. You might catch me on CNN here and there, you know. I saw you. I saw you. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, you know, other than that, I'm out doing God's work, man. Highly recommend the book. The book was awesome. Very well done. Very impressed. Your story is incredibly inspiring. So thanks again for coming on the show. People are going to really enjoy this one and appreciate your time. For sure. Thank you, brother. You got it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.